Hello, everybody. My name is Michaela, and I am IBM alum. That's how I got introduced to um, Intersource Commons. I um, actually recently left IBM uh, and am on my way to some new adventures, which uh, I will, you know, if you want to find out what's going on, I will be posting on LinkedIn all the things that are happening for me. Um, but I'm very, very passionate about Intersource. Um, as you can see, I'm wearing my Born to Intersource uh, uh, t-shirt today and wanted to make sure that I was ready to go. Um, but I, 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 part of what I wanted to do today really was to talk a little bit about low and no code um, uh, Intersource contributions. And so how do we, how do we unlock Intersource and, and the power that is actually incumbent uh, within an Intersource community in order to be able to do that? And so um, in order to kind of move forward, I'm going to take you back just a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about about uh, kind of just a really brief, brief history of open source, uh, the evolution of it, and how it's kind of changed over the course of time. You know, um, uh, you know, open source uh, is essentially what has led to inner source, obviously. Um, you know, some of the key things that I really want to just kind of point out is um, uh, on the timeline really is um, Eric S. Raymond publishes The Cathedral and the Bazaar. So this was a, a sort of anecdotal way for him to process and discuss um, and it's a very interesting read. If you're ever interested, I highly recommend that uh, that you that, that you read it um, whenever you get a chance. But really, he's looking he, the way that he describes sort of the difference between open source and uh, uh, and inner source, um, or at least the cathedral and the bazaar. The cathedral is really sort of a closed system. Uh, that's the old way of doing things. This is where we wanted to keep things. You know. You really uh, talk about those kinds of things. You couldn't have that open collaboration the way that you do uh, with open source. And so it really wasn't something that people considered being possible uh, until later on when, um, you know, when, when uh, and he was also challenging uh, Linus Torvald's um, uh, Linux kernel, this, this sort of, you know, free form uh, collaboration model that, that was there and available. And, um, you know, the problem that we run into more than anything else in these closed systems and closed environments is, is systemic fr friction. So I talked to, you know, asked the questions earlier, and I think this is just an area that, that um, I have found to be an incredible challenge with respect to, um, you know, driving intersource and intersource practices, uh, uh, um, uh, across the board. And so uh, the thing that it, it tends to do is it creates a lot of fragmentation. So if somebody comes in, they see some documentation, it doesn't have a readme file. Well, you can't really do anything with a readme file. You can't use Copilot with a readme file. You can't, if it's not available, you'll have to rewrite it, et cetera. There's not consistency around that. That really causes problem and frustration and, and it creates a, a significant amount of inefficiency and it um, reduces the ability to be able to adopt things like AI. So, you know, when I was at IBM, that was the area that we were focusing in on was driving AI adoption internally uh, in order to be able to create that demand. Um, I think, um, um, uh, Professor Chesbro, you know, mentioned it earlier that you know we're doing a lot of pushing with AI, not a lot of pulling. And so, one of the things we got to do is figure out how do we um, remove that friction in such a way that we can increase that um, uh, inefficiency. So, you know, this is the world we live in today. I want to get to a different world. Um, uh, you know, around the corner. And so in order to do that, we really have to kind of take a look at the, um, the, the open ecosystem and the versus the closed ecosystem. And I think that that's really what, what we're really talking about. And so this is why I like that, that piece, the, the, even though it was written in the 1990s, it is still relevant in that it really helps to describe the difference between the two different kinds of systems. One of them is a group of people are going to kind of keep things uh, in house, they're going to control the thing, you know, you can earlier about the importance of understanding that it's we not I this is our code not my code this is our documentation not my documentation that mental shift is still an ongoing process and we haven't finished that and so adopting this culture uh, of uh, you know of openness um, across the board whether it's an open innovations community, whether it is, you know, an open ecosystem, as in the example of the bazaar that they use um, in that piece. So when you have a high friction environment, um, uh, or excuse me, when you have a closed ecosystem, those are the environments where 
friction increases over the course of time and it really does hamper and get in the way of innovation. And I actually really like this, this photo, this uh, picture, because that's kind of what it feels like. It's like, we have the ability to go and expand across all of these places, but if we don't actually take the time to build out the infrastructure and the support necessary in order for that collaboration to flourish, we're, we're not going to get as far as we need to go. So, you know, it's as much a, a cultural and mental shift, but it's also, we need to do the things that underpin all of that. Things like having good documentation, making sure that things are repeatable, checking the process to make sure that the process is working for everybody because overlay AI on a bad process and you still have a bad process and it's now just amplified because now it's frustrating to everybody because they don't understand where the problem is. Um, you know, when we cling to these outdated methods, um, you know, it prevents us from being able to have those new ideas come to the surface and, and create those innovation, innovative new ideas. You can't bring people together in that way when this stuff is, is, is sort of in the way. And so it's really, really important. You know, the key thing for me really is, is it's really this friction. How do you get rid of that friction? Well, you need to build an infrastructure and a support mechanism and scaffolding that is going to help people get through those friction when it's really high and you need somebody to go in and break down that friction and it's not necessarily the most fun job in the world. So what I'm proposing is that what we actually need to have in order to get to this beyond code state is we've got to open up the ecosystem. We need to build intersource as an experience by creating a systematic approach that fosters that's focused in on enabling collaboration, co-creation, and reuse, and we have to provide the mechanisms, the tools, the templates, education, right? Knowledge acquisition. You saw the diagrams that uh, Dr. Chesbro mentioned when he was talking about the knowledge flows. Knowledge flow is the key here, right? If we understand where the knowledge is flowing, then we can actually do something about making sure that the education gets into the hands of the right people, the knowledge gets into the hands of the people so that we can create that pull and we can actually maximize the impact of what we're doing at scale. But, you know, uh, in order to do that, we really need to understand what the foundational practices of inner source and open source are. Um, there are four ones that, 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 uh, my, that, that I had identified um, in, in, in helping to do the transformation and, and organizational transformation that we did for uh, at IBM with respect to our um, uh, with respect to our AI, which directly led to the to the launch of Watson X in 2023. So, you know, just kind of a, a brief um, uh, background on, on me. I, I was part of the Watson um, NLP organization. And when COVID hit, we got the, you know, it was all hands on deck. Everybody had to do something. And so we all dove in and we found this project. And what we were doing is we were working with the um, weather app uh, uh, company, um, which was a, an uh, IBM company at the time. And that, I don't know if you remember, but there was a little sort of a, um, a feature that was added where you could actually take a look at the map and take a look at a map in the United States and Europe uh, and see how many cases or what the cases were, whether they were increasing or decreasing. And you could make a determination as to whether or not say, I'm going to go visit my mom because now we're seeing this, this spike in cases. So the idea here was is that we leveraged our uh, AI technology Watson and NLP in order to be able to drive and do that application. The problem was, and I'm very proud of that project, but it was also very bittersweet. And it's one of those things that I've been on a mission ever since to try and fix the, fix the problem. And that is we did not have the infrastructure in place to facilitate collaboration, communication, connectivity, consistency, repeatability, reuse, all of those things needed to be in place in order for us to do that. And unfortunately, we ran out of runway and, and ran out of, you know, leadership. It was like, okay, now it's time to, we, we got to actually now focus in on driving the business again. And so, you know, because that infrastructure wasn't in place, we were not able to do more. And I had already teed up, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to go global. I, I always think big and I wanted to go global and I wasn't able to do that. And so it was one of those things that I, I really started to kind of hone in where, where was it that we needed to go in order to create that, um, in order to create that, that pull uh, that we wanted to see, um, uh, see happening with our AI. And we were actually really, truly able to do that and do that transformation. Um, but it, it, it was a long, it was a long journey and, 
and uh, you know, we learned a lot from it. Um, one other thing that we actually also learned as part of this process uh, to, to going from, you know, going beyond code essentially, because we're now actually, we, we have, um, we, uh, IBM has uh, what's known as um, uh, Instruct Lab, which is actually the first uh, form of open source uh, large language model contributions that you can make. Um, we worked really closely with the team there to try and keep the amount of friction and the learning curve as low as possible so that people could actually make those contributions uh, to those uh, to those uh, uh, models um, and, and actually do, uh, you know, participate in this process. Um, and so as part of what we learned was is that there are some key catalysts that make good candidates for inner source or for collaboration. The first thing, of course, is going to be infrastructure, because, of course, that's the thing I'm going to think about, because that was the thing that got in my way. Uh, the infrastructure needs to be in place in order to get rid of that friction, in order to drive that collaboration. Um, you want to um, uh, you, you want to make sure that what you're doing is business essential. So you want to reduce the amount of redundancy. Reinventing the wheel is not a good time for anybody. You've already got a wheel. Why are we doing it 10 different times in 10 different ways when we actually already know how to do a wheel? Well, it's because we're not talking to each other. It's because there's no uh, way of having that knowledge flow happen appropriately so that we're not being redundant. We're not looking around ourselves first and foremost uh, to see, you know, where people are. Um, we want to make sure that we are paying it forward. Don't look at what you're building today as something you're building for today. You're not building for today, for inner source or for even open innovations. It's all about tomorrow. What is the path that you're going to do? How are you going to build that roadmap for other people to follow you? That's what you have to think. And it's a complete shift in the way in which we have to think about it. But if you have a project that has that kind of element to it, that's a great catalyst for inner source. Um, and last but not least is cutting edge. So obviously AI is the, is the latest cutting edge. Um, I had, uh, right before I left uh, IBM, I was uh, working with the, um, um, with the quantum team, uh, with their open source um, projects and, and really working to that. So you can actually accelerate the pace of innovation and getting things through, uh, you know, getting things into the hands of clients. And so the, um, I can't remember what Dr. Chesbro said, but it was like the outside out. Uh, uh, this allows you to get to that outside out, right? You can't get from one to the other if you, if you don't have that sort of cutting edge uh, structure. Um, and if you if you can take all of these things into consideration, the value of taking the time and the effort, because investing in infrastructure, investing in breaking down silos, investing in um, uh, in, in it's not it's not exciting. It's not you know nobody wants to build a platform for the back end of something that nobody's ever really going to see. I mean, some people do like coding, but a lot of the stuff that you end up doing that is sort of the back end pieces of it are really, really important, but it's not really as, as exciting. You don't really get recognized for it as much. And so it, it often becomes a hard slog. And so um, in order to get to that centralized, accessible, transparent platform for where you can share code or, or knowledge or resources that are going to foster collaboration and reuse, um, you got to take the time, you've got to allow it to percolate, and you got to give the people who are doing those things the ability to be able to kind of move forward with that. Um, you will get an open community. You can have a thriving community of contributors, but you have to help that community grow. You have to help that community be successful. Saying I have an open source project and sticking it out into the world and saying, oh, well, you know, I've got two people contributing or two people using it. That's not really going to get you where you need to go. And I think that sometimes is kind of the idea is, oh, if I kick it over the fence, it'll be just fine. Uh, what you want to do is you need to take a, a, an active interest in the community, take an active interest in helping to lead people, lead people, mentor people. You want to make sure that you're looking at continuous ways of improving not only the platform, um, but also the documentation. Are you, have you checked the user experience? You know, when was the last time you checked the user experience? Um, you know, it, th there's a number of things that you can do. And then last but not least is really this notion of open learning. I, I, I love this. I love the term openness because the idea there it's not open doesn't mean chaos so i just want to make that really really clear a lot of times people look at this and they think oh okay well so you can do whatever you want to i was an agile coach and a lot of times people were like oh if i do agile i don't have to plan that's not true at all um you have to actually do these things in order you have to set those foundational elements in place that scaffolding needs to go up you cannot build a house without the foundation 
the foundation comes from the platform, the community, and from the ability to be able to exchange knowledge, to know where to get that knowledge, to acquire that knowledge, to deliver that knowledge to somebody else. And we need to be able to empower those individuals who are participating in these ecosystems in order to do that. It's it's messy, um, but I highly encourage you to take the time, allow those things to percolate and embrace the mess. Go make a contribution to something you've never made a contribution before. Uh, offer and volunteer to write documentation for a program that you know nothing about. Take the time to do that sort of heavy lifting. You will not be sad that you did it. It is hard to do, but nothing that's really worth it is ever, um, you know, if it's it's really worth the effort to go to that because what you will get out of it is truly exponential. Um, don't reinvent all the wheels. We keep doing this over and over and over again. If you see your friend doing that, redirect them, tell them about Intersource, tell them about open innovation, tell them about AI, tell them about the things that you have access to, share it with your friends, bring them aboard and help them understand um, that if they think about the notion of reuse and repeatability, I got to build this thing. I got to make it go like, step one, step two, step three, rinse, repeat. Okay. Does it repeat? Okay. I got to go back and redo it. Right. Think about those kinds of things as you're building these things out. Think about the experience of the person who's going to come after you. Think about or rethink. It takes time to get in the habit of rethinking, but once you do, it gets easier and easier over time. We just have to remove the dirt and the rust. And I just love this quote. Um, uh, this is another great book. If you have not picked it up, um, uh, rethinking is a skill set, but it's also a mindset. Don't get too married to your code because it's not yours. It really should belong to everybody. Um, you know, in, in the sense of from your own organizations, your own team, if you've got inner source, if you're trying to collaborate with others, it doesn't belong to you. And also don't hold it so precious, right? Ideas can be thrown away on a regular, I highly recommend you throw those like, you are not your ideas, you are not your code, right? We do this thing where we hold on to it so tightly, we don't think, oh, hey, I got to do this thing. Oh, now somebody, because it makes us vulnerable. We're worried that somebody's going to judge us or judge something that we did. And so I think that's kind of what comes into play. Don't worry about it. Nobody's, if they're judging you, forget forget about them. You don't need to worry about them. All you really have to do is, is find out, pursue the knowledge, pursue the, the work and do the mental work that you need uh, in order to be able to um, actually really um, find ways to solve a problem for one person that then can solve a problem for many. It is an exponential curve and it's the most exciting thing you'll ever see, but it does take time to get to that point. Um, and that's the last one I have. So I didn't, mine's not, it wasn't a very long, it was a very long session. So I wanted to kind of open it up. Um, I just, you know, I'm super passionate about this and I think it's really important uh, for us to remember that, you know, look for the opportunity to bring inner source into many spaces. You can do it in education, you can do it with content, you can do it with documentation. Think of things that maybe I haven't even mentioned, you know, throw out ideas, anything is possible. Do inner source for all the things.